Hallelujah. What I want to share this morning, and I'm going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 36, and I think this falls in the 37 as well. But how many of you, when you read your Bible, you've got that caption over it, and then it tells you kind of what, what you're about to read, you know what I'm saying? I know that wasn't inspired by men, but men put that in there to kind of show you, okay, this is kind of what you're about to read is about. Well, there's stories in the Bible I've read time and time again, and so I was just reading this one again the other day. And it's in Isaiah 36 in the caption of this particular Bible right here. Uh, it says there's a caption, you know, the bold caption tells about what's going on in chapter 36 or about what, what the story is about to be. And it says, in my caption it says, Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria, threatens Jerusalem. And like I said, I've read that story over many times, but when I came across it again, and especially in light of what's been going on in our country, with the riots, the pulling down of statues, and all of that, thank you, Tracy, the captions of the words kind of changed in my mind from Sennacherib, which was again this king of, of Assyria, threatens Jerusalem, to Satan threatens the church. Satan threatens the church. And church, I'm just going to, Lord just put some things down. I just, I was writing it out. So I'm just going to, I usually don't like to read through my notes, but I don't want to miss anything. So I'm just going to kind of read to you what God kind of put in my heart in this first part of this message here. Church, we've got to understand that there's a battle going on in the United States for the soul of this nation. And the enemy knows who his greatest adversary is. And it's the church of Jesus Christ. It's not a political person. It's not even the president. As much as he gets dogged, okay, if you will. But that's not it. The real enemy is the church of Jesus Christ. And I feel like this is something God wanted me to say to help you to understand that as things continue... You're going to see that more and more. You're going to see the church getting targeted more and more. And so we've got to understand there's a battle going on for the United States, for the soul of this nation, and the enemy, again, he knows, he knows, the enemy knows who his greatest adversary is. Right. It is the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. When statues were being toppled, it started with Confederate soldiers and leaders of the South, as you all know, but some people of wisdom spoke up and said this, that's just a sham. It will go beyond that. There are those who have, who have infil infiltrated some of these well-meaning groups who truly wanted to conduct a peaceful protest, okay? They are. There's some that truly did. Wanted to, I experienced that when we had the thing up here in Alexander City. But there's these groups that, have, that want to undermine the very fabric of our nation. And this person, these people are saying it won't just be the Confederate monuments, it will be all monuments that represent the United States and what the God-fearing founder and founding father stood for. Amen. You would have just said, they said, when this started, when all the statues started coming down, of course it was about Confederate, you know, in the South and things and all that, I understand the Civil War. But someone spoke of wisdom, and let me just tell you, I, I, actually a lady from another country, I was watching this the other day, I can't remember what country she was from, she said, this is, I think it was Venezuela, she said this is exactly how it happened in Venezuela. At first it was statues of people that were really, they wanted just to do life, but then it went beyond that and just everything got chaotic, and now the country has gone to practically nothing. And, and she said she sees, when she started seeing this happen in America, she could see the very same pattern start to fall. If we don't get a hold of it now, it's just going to lead the same way. Amen. And so, again, there was those with wisdom that spoke up and said, it won't just be certain statues. It'll be all. Anything that has to do with the founding of what this, this nation was founded on. We know that it was founded on the Word of God or the true history. Okay? Founding fathers who feared God. Church, the separation of church and state was never about saying that, that God can have no influence in our government. It was saying that the government cannot dictate what goes on in the church. Okay, but that has been totally twisted around. So now you can't pray in school, you can't do all these other things because of what has happened. 
happen because the people have got in there and twisted our history. And that's what, exactly what's going on right now. And there's these groups, anarchists, whatever you want to call them, that are trying to infiltrate, but they know, ultimately, because the devil knows and the demonic forces know that are motivating all this, they know who the true enemy is. Right. First of all, it's God and it's his people. And you need to understand that. You need to understand that. Uh, it even went beyond the statues to the church right across the street from our nation's capital being burned and then graffitied. And then a statement was put out by an anarchist group to start targeting religious monuments such as the white Jesus and stained glass miracles and things like this. So I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's going beyond because we have to understand our battle is not, and I say that over and over, our battle is not with people. It's not with flesh and blood. It's not with people of color or nationality or anything else. The battle is against Satan and his demonic powers. We have got to understand that. Okay, this is a spiritual battle. It can only be won with spiritual weapons. That's why we've got to pray. We have got to pray. We've got to seek the Lord for our country. To these anarchist groups and more so the demonic spirits behind these groups this is not about a color of skin because no life matters to the enemy of our souls no life matters to the enemy of our souls to say no life matters and he would love nothing better to see mankind God's most prized creation that was created in his image hate one another and destroy one another now, he would love nothing better for that to happen. I'm here to tell you this morning that every life matters to God. Amen. God created mankind from the dust of the earth. And as a, one of my first Bible school teachers told me, she said this. She goes, God created mankind from the dust of the earth, which is made up of the red clay, the yellow clay, the black soil, the white sand, the brown soil. Listen, your Bible says, your Bible says, for God so loved the world. All lives matter to God. All lives matter. So when I saw this caption in the Bible where it says, the neck with threatens Jerusalem, all I could see is that right now it could just as easily say, Satan threatens the church. Satan threatens the church. Why do I say that? I want to just take the next few minutes and just... Show some things. This king of Assyria, as we're about to read about it, I just want you to think for a moment how he could represent Satan. And then the king of Judah and the people of Judah, of course, representing the church, Hezekiah, who was the king at that time. So what had happened, just to, I'm going to give you some scriptures that will be up on the screen here in just a moment and when we get to them. But just to give you a little bit of background, the king of Assyria had come against Judah, the, 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 the kingdom of Judah, and it says that they had overtaken some of their fortified cities. Then the king of Assyria sent some of his commanders to Hezekiah with a message. And in this message that he sent, I just want to just, just kind of show you what, how that this message he sent to Hezekiah and God's people is very similar to what, how the devil is sending his messages to the church today. In Isaiah chapter 36 verse 4, he says this, Say to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, on what do you rest this trust of yours? In other words, so the king of Assyria is asking the, the, the people of God, on what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words and strat or strategy and power for war? And whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? So the king of Assyria is very intimidated. He's coming up, who do you think you are? Behold, you are trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who learns on it. In other words, Israel or Judah was kind of looking to, to Egypt at that time. You know, and again, this is well beyond when they were in slavery in Egypt, okay? But they were kind of looking to them for help at that time. But he says, you can't trust Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? In other words, what he was saying was, he was saying this, is, is are you saying that they, they had misinterpreted thinking here and understanding that Hezekiah was going down and 
tear down these altars, okay? And he was thinking that he was tearing down the very altars of God. But what he was tearing down, he was having one of those Second Chronicles seven fourteen times where God says, If my people will help themselves pray, seek my face, turn from the wicked ways, then I will move. Okay, and what he was doing is he was moving what the people of God had set up. Because the influence of the other religions and the other nations and what Hezekiah was breaking down was not monuments and, and things to the true God, but the ones that the people had turned to and compromised. Okay, he was having one of those moments, but it was being misconstrued here by this king thinking, that, well, you know, again, is it not he whose high places and altars has the kind of removed? And what I want to do this morning for just a couple of minutes is point out some tactics the enemy uses. He's using, we see it portrayed before us here in, the, in what's going on in our world right now, but it's also being, and is going to be used, is being used and will continue to be used against the church. And I just want to make you aware of this. So verse 8 says this, it says, Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able to, uh, uh, on your part, to set riders on them. And then I want to go down to verse 16. He says, Do not listen to Hezekiah. Don't listen to your king. For thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one will have his own fig tree and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, the land of grain and wine, a land of, a land of bread and vineyards. And let me tell you, this is one of the main lies of the enemy. Make a deal with me and I won't bother you anymore. Make a deal with me and I won't bother you anymore. Compromise, make a deal, and look, I won't bother anymore. Just look at how that worked out for some of the leaders in our nation toward the riders. We'll let you do what you want to do and then ask you simply to go away so we can get back to normal. Really? Give the enemy an edge and it will never satisfy him. You need to hear that. In your own personal life, in our nation, Give the enemy an inch in the church and it will never satisfy him. We thought we will appease certain groups by saying, okay, come on. We accept it. We accept you. And we do accept people. Don't get me wrong. Okay, we will never turn any way away from the church. But at the same time, we cannot accept the compromise. We cannot accept the lifestyle. Okay, because it's not our standard. It's God's standard. And so I want to make that clear. We never hate anyone or against any person. But we, you've got to have a standard. You've got to have a standard. And what we're seeing in our nation is there is no, it's like every standard is going to be just blown away. And so the enemy wants to compromise. He wants the church to compromise. Give the enemy an inch and it will never satisfy him. He will pray on your weakness and take more and more and more until finally you have to say, that's enough, no more, this is ending right now. Right. That's what you got to say in your own life as well. When the enemy wants you to compromise your testimony and your walk with God, at some point you're going to have to realize, man, I thought that he would just leave me alone. But he's never going to leave you alone until you make a stand Amen. and say, I'm going after God. Right. I'm going full heart after God. So that's one of his lies. You cannot negotiate with someone who wants to destroy you. Please understand that. Jesus said that the enemy only comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said the enemy only comes. He's not, he, doesn't, he doesn't have another tactic. He may wrap it in some other way to make it look nice. and Oh, if you'll do this, then we'll work out this compromise. His only goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's it. It's like, this is not on my notes, but I'll give it to you. Maybe you guys heard the story, an older story about this guy who was up on the mountain, and it was very cold up there, and he found this frozen snake. And in that story, the snake, you know, is this, you know, of course, this is obviously not true, but, but it makes the point. The snake spoke to the guy and said, please take me down to the bottom of the mountain. 
so I can, you know, I'm freezing to death up here. And so the guy says, ain't no way that I am putting you in my jacket and taking you down that mountain. And he says, oh, come on, I am freezing. I promise you, I will not bite you. I will not harm you. And it went back and forth, back and forth, to finally the guy says, okay. And so, of course, as they were going down the mountain, the, thing, the snake starts thawing out. And at the bottom of the mountain, he latches on to him, and he just drives in that bed. And the guy threw him off and said, you promised you wouldn't bite me. He goes, look, I am a snake. And that's what I do. Okay? <laughs> that's what I do. All right? If you're going to pick up a bit of a snake, he is going to bite you. Okay? He's going to bite you. And so that's what I'm saying. You don't think that we can compromise with the enemy and think, well, he, he said he wouldn't bite. You know what I'm saying? He has come to steal, kill, destroy, and that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. He will come into your mind as a Christian. If you, when, you're, when you're trying to get close to God, this is what happens so many times. And when you, God is moving on your heart, and man, I want to get close to God. I really want to go out all out for Him. And then things start kind of going crazy in your life. Because there is an adversary that what does not want you going after God. Okay? You start trying to get close to God and going out uh, after God. You go out and, and, and just, you know, want to give your best. Okay? And the enemy, what he will do, it says, if you go out after God, then I'll come out after you. And I'll give you my best. So you better just sit in your chair and be quiet. Come on now. Intimidation. Lies. Here's another tactic found in verse 10. Moreover, it, it, is it without the Lord? In other words, the king of Assyria is now saying, wasn't it the Lord? It, he was the one that, that sent me in the first place. He says, is it, was, is it without the Lord that I have come up against the land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against the land and destroy it. In other words, he was trying to make the people of God think, God sent me to do this to you. Twisting all our lies. Okay? That's another tactic of the enemy. The devil has some believers believe that God is out to get them and make their life miserable just waiting for them to make a mistake so he can make everything go wrong in their life. And so he uses that, twists God's word. Let me say this. God gives grace. God gives grace. God gives grace. But, don't take it for granted. And don't think you can take advantage of it to do what you want. But God does give you grace. Don't let the enemy come and lie to you and say, God, is, he's the one that sent me to do this to you. You are bad. You're, you, you just, you're just a terrible person. You've got too many things going on in your life. And you deserve what you're getting. Some people have fallen for that lie. God gives grace. But we, won't, we don't want to take it for granted. We don't want to take advantage of it. But the devil will lie to you. Jesus again said this. I think Jesus knew the enemy, right? John 8, 44, there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. The liar, he's a liar and the father of lies. And he's trying to twist and use God's words against you. He's been doing that ever since the Garden of Eden. Did God really say you know, don't eat from it. You know, and start getting to question God. That's exactly what we try to do in the church. You know, do we really need to, did God really mean that when he said that? Did God really mean that when he said that, that you should live this way and that this really isn't accepted? Did God really say that? Don't, we, don't you need to get a little bit more relevant with the times? Do you hear what I'm saying? Twisting. I wouldn't even have to be preaching this if this wasn't going on in the church today. But it is, I would have never dreamed some of the things that's going on in the church today. I, I, I just couldn't fathom it. Especially when it's right here in the book. It's right there. I mean, you can't get it. And I'm saying, when I come out and say something like that, I will get blasted. Okay? You will get blasted. Okay? And I'm not saying it against anyone, but there's got to be a standard. There's got to be a standard. And listen, as you and I continue to hold the standard, you've got to make a decision. Am I going to stand up for, for God's word? 
not in a mean, hateful, mean-spirited way toward people. But I'm talking about loving people, but not compromising your love for God and His Word. Okay? Do you hear what I'm saying? And so the enemy is going to try to twist, try to twist and use God's words against you and get you to compromise in some way. Did God really say that? The devil said to Adam and Eve? And that's why, Christian, you and I need to understand that Satan will twist the word and we need to know God's word. That's why I heard, That's why I'm always harping about you about reading your Bibles. Okay? I harp on that a lot. I know you guys get tired of hearing me say that, but if you don't have something in your life, a standard and something that you're you're getting from God that when things do come, you're going to be so confused and so twisted and so compromised. You don't, you don't, you're just, I don't even know if I'm going to deal with this anymore. This is, it's craziness. But you just got to understand God is the ultimate authority. He created us. We will stand before him one day and we will have to give an account to him. Every one of us will. And the Bible says this in 2 Timothy 2, 4, 15. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one of proof. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. In other words, we need to have a handle on God's word in our lives so that we, when things do come our way and, and it seems like people are trying to twist the word of God, you know, we can have something to say about that. Jesus faced this head on with Satan. Right here, it's found in Matthew 4, 6, and 7. Satan said to him, this is when Jesus was being tempted by him in the wilderness, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down to, to this pinnacle of the temple. And it says, for it's written, he will command his angels. In other words, the devil was using God's word. Come on now. You need to understand that. Just because someone is telling you God's word don't mean it lines up with God's word. That's why you need to know the word. But anyway, he says this. He says, um, he will command his angels concerning you. Jesus, just jump off the angels to catch you. Guess it. You know what Satan was? Or is? He was an angel. Don't you think he knew? A little bit, a little bit how God works. <laughs> and he said, on their, hands, uh, on their hands they will bury you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said, oh, okay. Here I go. That's what a lot of people do. You, you said, the preacher said, so here I go. Send in this money for this, you know, this, this holy water. Send in this money for this or that. I have never read a scripture that says anything about giving money for holy water. Now, I love to go to Israel. I love to get in the Dead Sea and the be baptized in Jordan, but that water is just water. It's just water. Okay, now, <laughs> but people, just because some preacher said it, they just take it lock, stock, and barrel. And, and Satan uses the word of God to twist. That's why we've got to know it. Jesus said to him, verse 7, again, it is written. What was he saying? Read the whole Bible. Don't just take one scripture and make it mean what you want it to mean what he was saying. Again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay? So that's another tactic. He tries to confuse, he tries to twist God's word. Let me give you another one. The third tactic is intimidation and fear, which go hand in hand. Intimidation and fear. Verse 11 says this, and the Lechem, and I'm not sure if I'm saying his names correctly, and Shebna and Joah said to God bless these moms. Amen. Uh, Rep Shaka. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please speak to your servants in Aramaic. For we understand it. Don't speak in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people on the wall. In other words, <laughs> it was crazy. That's just like saying, do it. Because it's saying, please don't speak in our language because we don't, I don't want the people to understand what you're saying. You might scare them. Now, if you go and tell that to the enemy, what do you think the first thing he's going to do? He is going to just, he starts and he, he does just that. And he says this, he says, and listen to what he says. I mean, oh, he just opened up the door for me, so he went for it. I mean, he went all in with what he said next. But Rosheka said, has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and just to you? And not just, and not to the men that are sitting on this wall who are doomed 
with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? I mean, you can't go any further than that. Yeah, I'm going to talk to them too, and I'm going to speak in their language and tell them, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't surrender and submit and give in. All you're going to have to eat is your own. And that's enough I didn't say about that. And then in verse 18, he goes on with this intimidation and fear. He says, Beware, lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying the Lord will deliver us. Don't listen to Hezekiah. He says God's going to be there for you and deliver you. And then he says this, Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of king, the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphapad? Where are the gods of <laughs> these places? All right. <laughs> Amen. Had they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their lands out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. Whoa! <laughs> you know what was coming after that. But let's talk about this tactic for a minute. The third tactic, tactic here, intimidation and fear, they go hand in hand. Notice the tactics. Fear that your God is not able that he can. Look at these others. Look at these other nations that used to have Christianity in them. And I'm coming to our own modern time now again. Look at these other nations. Man, Christianity was going, but hey, I took care of them. I'm going to take care of you too. We're going to wipe it out here too. First Peter chapter 5 verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Seeking someone to devour. And what he will do is in your Christian walk, he will try to intimidate you, put fear in your heart, fear of all the different things we've got going on right now. Okay, fear, intimidation. All right, and listen, we've got to come to the place either we're going to trust God or not. And God's going to see us through. Now, I'm, not, I'm not sitting here and telling you that we're not going to go through persecution. Okay? I'm not telling you that at all. Alright? But I am going to say God's going to see you through it. God's going to help you. He's going to see us through. I will tell you that, and we're talking about this on Wednesday nights, this little ball subject, but we're not going to endure the wrath of God. Okay? Because that's coming too. God's going to say that at some point to the world, that's it. That's it. It's going to be like in the days of Noah. That's it. Time for to judgment to begin. And we know that's coming. But thank God that he has spared us that. And you can hear that message on Wednesday nights. There's missionaries we have today. And this is something I think that when I first saw this, I thought, this is it. And I know it. I know this sounds, it sounds very serious because it is very serious. But our missionaries, some of our missionaries today, they're living by a slogan that says, live dead. Live dead. What does that mean? It means I'm going all out for God. My life is not my own. I belong totally to the Lord. And whatever happens to me, if He, if he allows it, so be it. Live dead. And I'm saying that's the attitude in serving the Lord. And I know you said, Brother well, Mike, get that a little bit extreme. Didn't Jesus say, Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might? I didn't say that. He said it. Did Jesus say you can't serve God and these other things? You can't serve God and mammon? Because you're going to hate the one and be devoted to the other or love the one and, and hate the other? He says you've got to pick up. you got to pick a side. Mm-hmm. You've got to pick a side. you got to, and you can't go half-hearted. Christianity, I've told you this for years, Christianity does not work halfway. You cannot go 50-50, 60-40, 80-20. It's, it's got to be 100 to zero. Okay? I'm saying that that's the only way it's going to work. If you want to experience the presence of God, whew, Amen. Whew. Yes. Whew. Sorry. I'm not apologizing. I'm not apologizing. Somebody said, Brother Mike, quit apologizing to the Lord moving on. <laughs> so, okay. We'll review there. I appreciate it. But, listen. Praise God. I don't even know I, I got on track. If you want the power of God, the presence of God, the only way you're going to experience is going on. 
we're going to experience the presence of God as church. We've got to decide. We're all in. Amen. When it's time to worship, I mean, let's worship. Amen. Okay? And I'm not saying you got to scream and shout and all that. If you, if you do, that's, that's all right. As long as you do it, and it's, it's, it's God. But you be you, and you just let go and let God move in your life. Amen. You'll, we can hinder God in so many different ways. Listen, God bless you. God bless you today. I appreciate you just letting God just just because you, you you came to my mind today. I'm not trying to perish up prom, you know I'm not. But man, you I just your face is one of the first faces that came and then when I saw Jenny over there praying with you, I thought, Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. She just got some freedom. She got some rest. She got some peace. That's what God wants. But we can't do it until we let go and just let God. Amen. Hallelujah. Another tactic that the enemy is this, don't listen to your leaders. Now, I'm not saying that to say, okay, now you can listen to everything God say, okay? <clears throat> but listen, let me, just, let me show you how it works. Verse 13 is this guy, Rabshakeh, stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah. Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. And that's exactly what the enemy will try to do. And, and, and this is how this kind of works, I found. It seems like, anyway. Don't listen to what those preachers are saying. Those preachers are they're preaching the word of God. Okay? And what they're trying to do is they're trying to incite rebellion. Isn't that what we're seeing happen in our culture as well? Just inciting rebellion. Those preachers, like Pastor Mike, he just overzealous. They are ministers. They're supposed to say things like that. So, so it's sure to listen to them. Make them feel good. Tell them it was a good message. But don't go out and practice that stuff. Somebody might think you're a religious fanatic. You know what I'm saying? And that's what he was saying. Don't let this, this king here is over you tell you that God's going to deliver you out of my hand. Because that's what, you know, Hezekiah was trying to say. Hezekiah was, he was, he was afraid too. You read that in the scripture. And I'm going to share what he did here in just a moment to deal with all this. But they were trying to get him to just, again, turn against each other, turn inward. Said, oh, you don't need to listen to that. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, and it may be said about me, it's about some people, I don't know. But that preacher, he, he just ruined it for me. You know, he hurt me. Or they said something or whatever. I, I tell you that. And some of it, it is the preacher's fault. Okay? Some of it's just preachers preaching the word. People don't hear it. Okay? Anyway, don't listen to those preachers. They're overzealous. And I'm saying if, I, if I'm overzealous, I'm in good company. Okay? The Bible says that Jesus... In John 2, 17, listen to what it says. I think I put this up on the, where you can see it on the scripture. It says, his disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house. Ooh, zeal for your house will consume me. You know what Jesus was doing at the time? He was going to the temple of God and throwing over tables. He was a little bit zealous, wasn't he? Jesus did that. He was throwing over tables. Yes, he said, you made this place which is to be a house of prayer to a den of thieves. You're trying to make money off of God. Here are these people that are coming in and they're trying to worship God and sacrifices and you just turn it into a big marketplace. Come over here and buy it for me. Come over here and buy it for me. It's not about buying. It's not about money. It's about worship. Amen. It's about coming to these people can worship God and just give Him, give themselves to Him. But man, don't we make a profit. People make a profit. It's sickening and God's going to hold us accountable for that. He is. Hallelujah. So zeal, yeah. I think we need to be zealous. You know, zealous with knowledge. Not just, just go nuts and stuff like that. But we, we, we need to have some zeal for God. We need to have some zeal for the things of God. We need to stand up for what's right. And here was the response of the people who were listening to all this that these guys were saying. In verse 21, it says that they were silent. And answered him not a word. In other words, the guys that were sitting up on the, the wall and all the people there of Judah were listening to these guys 
us say all this stuff. But they were silent and answered him not a word. For the king's command was, do not answer him. Then Elkim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household in Shebna, the secretary, and, and these other guys, okay, uh, told, uh, went out and told Hezekiah what all these things said. But listen to what he says here, their response. He says, the king had told them, don't, don't engage the enemy. In other words, don't get in an argument with the enemy. Okay, when you get in an argument with a fool, okay, you're going to look like a fool. The Bible says that. Okay, Proverbs talks about that. Alright, and you're just going to, all you're going to do, you're not going to win an argument that someone's already made up their mind about something. When someone's frustrated and hot, you've seen that on TV if you've watched any of this stuff. When someone's hot and bothered about something, just you trying to bring in some, <laughs> some wisdom, it's not going to be heard. And it would just be foolish. And he says, don't engage the enemy. Don't, don't respond. Don't respond. Okay? And 1 Peter 5, 9, after it says, your enemy the devil goes around seeking someone to devour, the next verse says this, resist him, firm in your faith. Listen, Jesus, when he was faced with the enemy, not one time did he get into a conversation with the devil. Not, not beyond other than quoting God's word. I want to clarify that. He talked to him, but he talked to him with the word. Every time. You go through there, you won't see any time he starts getting into a conversation. Well, what about this? What about that? Well, why don't you think of it this way? No, he said, this is what God's Word says. And that's all I need. You know what I'm saying? Don't engage with an argument. Then he's going to come in your mind and he's going to try to put all kinds of stuff in your head. Lies and half-truths and things like this. What if, what if, what if. And you've just got to decide, I'm going to speak God's Word. I'm going to stand on God's Word. And I'm going to say this, and I'm getting close to being done. I'm halfway through my notes. No. <laughs> Jesus takes it personally when his church is persecuted. I want you to know that. When his church is threatened and persecuted, he takes it personally. I'm going to give you a case in point. Saul, before he became Paul, as we all know, the Apostle Paul, the Bible says he was on his way through Israel to a place called Damascus. He had papers in his hands to go and arrest Christians and throw them in the jail. And in Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 5, I want you to see this. This is referring to Paul or Saul at this time. So now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know what I'm saying? He takes it personally. When things are going on in your life, in my life, in the church life, Jesus takes it very personal. Why are you persecuting not my church? Not these believers. You are persecuting me. Amen? Amen. And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. You're going to put some of my folks in jail, but really what you're doing is you're coming after me. Amen. Jesus identifies with his church, with his body, that we are called the body of Christ. Anyway, God responds to this king of Assyria's threats, especially when he said, What God can deliver you from my hand? Look what's happened to all the other plans I've conquered. And when I first read that story, for the very first time, I knew enough about God to know, this is about to get good right here. And I knew God wasn't going to put up with that. I just knew, just my limited knowledge at that time, when first reading the story, I knew there was gonna, something was going to happen. And it, and, and it did. King of Assyria had to pull away, the Bible says, because of another thing that was going on. He had to pull his army out and go deal with that. But before leaving, he sent word to Hezekiah with a, a handwritten message. And uh, Isaiah 37, verse 10, 11 says, here's, here's what this handwritten message, at least part of it said. It says, do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands. The 
molding them to destruction, and shall you be delivered? And the next, the next two verses, he talks about some of the lands he left, some of the lands that they'd already conquered. So I love, listen to what Hezekiah did. Hezekiah takes this letter, he went to the house of the Lord, and he spread it out before the Lord. And just to paraphrase, he said, Lord, look at this. Please help. Okay? I'm just narrowing it down real quick for you. Lord, look at this letter that the enemy has read. This intimidating, trying to put fear, trying to cause uh, confusion, division, and all these things. And just listen, listen to what he's saying about you, God. That's basically what he says. He spreads out that letter before the Lord. And that's a good thing to do, by the way. If you ever get something in the mail, <laughs> and it's maybe not a good report, and you're trusting God, take that thing and say, Lord, I am doing everything I can to honor you and honor your word. And you see what I'm facing right now. And just lay it out before me. Let God glorify himself through your circumstances. Amen? Amen. And so he says this in verse 20, 37, verse 20. So now, Lord, our God, save us from his hand, in other words, from the king of Assyria's hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are Lord. You know, that's my prayer right now. It really is. I'm, I'm praying, God, do something. Do something to let the world know. And I, I, I know he has sent Jesus. Amen. Amen. And, and he has done that. And I believe the next big event is really going to drive people nuts when the church leaves out of here. <laughs> Amen. I was just noticing the other day, and I always wondered about this, and again, this is a little bit off the subject, but there's talking more about more UFOs now. They're even talking about it. So they're actually about to release something from the government talking about it. And so I know that when that happens, that's probably going to be one of the things they're going to say. UFOs came and got them. That's what it is. UFOs, I told you they were real. I, tell, I guarantee you that's going to be one of the explanations. I told you they were real. Anyway, but that's my sincere prayer that God will do something so powerful in the days in which we're living right now that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that He alone is Lord. That He alone is Lord. Now let's look at God's response, and I'm going to close with this. Isaiah 37, 21, 22. Listen, I wanted to say this because this is important. This is God's response. He, he, he goes, he says, take this to a message to Isaiah, the, the man of God, and, and see if he's got a word for the Lord. And so that's what he does. And then Isaiah responds by saying this, because you have, or on God's behalf, he says, because you have prayed to me concerning this king of Assyria. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. I'm going to read that in just a second, but listen to what he says. Because you have prayed. Because you have prayed. Folks, the enemy wants to stop your prayer life. God knows the power of your prayer life. Satan understands the power of the person that's praying. Why do you think it's so hard to get people to pray? Pray together. Okay? But there's got to be prayer. That's why on, on July 14th, we're going to do this 7. We're going to pray 7-14 on 7-14. Okay, and I, I encourage you that day, fast with me and pray that day that God will just touch our nation. Amen. On July 14th, okay, on Tuesday. And I'm gonna probably what we're going to do is that, that evening at 7-14 p.m. Is, is get on our Facebook page and then have a prayer time together unless we choose to do something here. If you've got some ideas of maybe what we can do with that, just let me know and we can, uh, you know, we can see what we can put together. But I want us to do something on that day and pray 714 on 714. That's just got something God put that on my heart even before the coronavirus over hit this year. It's amazing how God kind of prepares you for things you don't even realize it. But anyway, let's look at God's answer and then we're going to close. So Isaiah is responding on God's behalf to the king. He says, Whom have you mocked and reviled? Now this is this is addressed to the king of Assyria. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your servants you have mocked the Lord, and you have said, With my many chariots I have gone up to the heights of the mountains, to the far recesses of Lebanon, to cut down the tallest cedars, 
His choice of cypress is to come to the remotest height, its most fruitful forest. I took wells and drank waters to drink up with the sole of my foot all the streams of Egypt. And then listen to what God says. In other words, he was, this is what the guy was bragging about, all the things he had done. And then God says this in verse 26. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? In other words, don't you realize that you wouldn't even be doing this unless I determined that you were going to be doing this? I plan from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruins, while their inhabitants shorn of short strength are dismayed and confounded and have become like plants of the field and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops blighted before it's grown. I know, and he's talking again, this is God responding to the enemy, I know you're sitting down, and I know you're going out, and I know you're coming in, and I know you're raging against me. And I just want you to know this. God sees what he's doing. He sees what he's going to try to do against the church. He sees it. I want you to understand that. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the kingdom of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way he came, by the same way he shall return. And he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own, for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Who he made a covenant to. And the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all, there were all these dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. And listen, as he was worshiping in his house, his God, his two sons came and killed him with a sword. Basically, that's what it says. They struck him down with a sword. Listen, I'm coming to defy your God. Hey, no one can beat us. No one can beat our gods. So he's going to worship at his God. And his own children kill him. You know what I'm saying? God's got it. God's got it. I want you to understand there's some tactics that the enemy will use, is using, has been using, but it may get more intense as the day goes, the days go on. Okay? And I'm not trying to do any gloom or anything, but I think we need to understand that. That we need to understand that the battle is not the flesh and blood. This is a spiritual warfare. This is something that's going on who knows where? We just don't know. You know, I actually believe that when the angels, I, I've never thought about it this way until I heard a preacher talk about this. I, I think I even preached this on Christmas. But those hosts got there to announce Jesus' birth. I wonder if they just had a, a major battle right before they got there. Because God was doing something. He was sending his son to the earth. It says the host of heaven. I mean, God could have just sent one and said, hey, he's coming. <laughs> I mean, it was a host. I want to some of them just had their swords coming. You know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we just took care of some business. He's here now. Amen. Come on. The host of heaven. Even the Lord's called the captain of the Lord's host, referring to his angelic beings. And so, yeah, he's here now. Yeah, we took care of business. That's right. He's here. And I'm just saying that God's got it. Amen. And there are angels. I'm going to preach and teach on that at some point. Because we should never worship angels. Never, ever. But God's got angels. And they're out there. And they're working on our behalf. The Bible says they come to minister to those who will inherit salvation. In Hebrews it talks about that. There's angels out there. There's forces of, of God that are working for us. So please understand, we are not alone. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's why the church is going to be unified. That's why the church has got to be strong. That's why the church has got to allow the presence, the power, and the move of God in our lives to strengthen us. We can't go out and be weak, need, and just feeble Christians and think we're going to make a difference in this world. Okay? It's got to be the power of God. And if, and if it's not flowing through you and in your life, then how in the world are you going to be able to influence anyone else's life? Okay? So I'm saying we come together. Let's honor him. Let's worship him. Let's let God be God. If he if he convicts you of something, man, get in the altar. Okay? Don't let anything hinder you from 
anything to get between you and your relationship with God. Nothing. Nothing. And we, we've kind of lost that, it seems like, in the church. It's like, hear the message, and we'll go home. Nice message, Brother Mike. Okay. I'm saying if God moves on you, you need to respond. Because if you don't respond and God is moving on your heart, your heart's going to get hard. It's going to get hard. Every time you turn off the Holy Spirit, you don't realize it's almost like crustiness starts building. Okay? And but when you surrender and just let the Lord begin to flow, hallelujah, it's like that river, Jesus said, like rivers of living water flowing from your inmost being. That's what he said it would be like. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, it would be like rivers of living water just to flow. It's not a stagnant pond. Okay? It's a flowing river. That's one reason we chose the name River of Life. Because we want this to be in your life and in this community a river of life. Amen? And I don't know nothing better to see God. Whew, God just come all over us in such a powerful way as we allow Him to. And that word starts getting out. People say, I need some of that. I need that. I need that in my life. I need to know that God is real. I need to experience the Lord in my life. I need to know that He's real. And He is real. Amen. So that's that's what God thought.